Hello everyone, and welcome to episode 14. In the last episode, I discussed the various genetic experiments conducted by Gregor Mendel, and how his work provided the basis for the study of genetics. The principles that Mendel came up with, namely that of segregation and independent assortment, could be explained through meiosis, which I'll talk about today. The scientists Theodore Bavari and Walter Sutton publicized this hypothesis in 1902, although they were far from the first scientists to study and publish findings on meiosis. Meiosis was first discovered in the late 1800s by zoologists who were researching eggs. The first discovery came in 1876, when a German zoologist named Oskar Hertwig described the event in sea urchin eggs. The second discovery came in 1883, when a Belgian zoologist named Edward van Beneden studied the chromosomes of the eggs of the Ascaris roundworm. It's not too surprising that meiosis was discovered through the study of eggs, which are one of two types of gametes produced by meiosis. The gametes are haploid, produced after DNA recombination between the homologous chromosome pairs, and then separation of the homologs into the individual gametes, or a halving of the chromosome number. This is, of course, the process of meiosis, which I'll be discussing in greater detail in this episode. Before I get into the meat and potatoes of meiosis itself, I need to explain a little bit about the chromosomes themselves. The process of meiosis is, after all, the process of the chromosomes of a single cell being equally separated into four gametes. So what are chromosomes? They're basically the superstructure of a DNA molecule when it's wound up tightly into a packaged format. Understand that the DNA molecule is basically one very long string. Each of your cells has 46 string-like molecules of DNA, 23 from your father, 23 from your mother. Each of these 46 DNA molecules has a different length, and when coiled and compacted down into a dense chromosome, they have different sizes. For that matter, specific chromosomes have bulges and rings, or places where the DNA is packed looser or tighter. I should mention that chromosomes are also heavily composed of proteins, which facilitate the proper movement, wrapping, and organization of the DNA in the chromosome. Most chromosomes are autosomes, meaning they're non-sex chromosomes. In fact, 44 of our 46 chromosomes are autosomes. The remaining chromosomes are the sex chromosomes. Females possess two copies of an X chromosome, while males have one X chromosome and one Y chromosome. These sex chromosomes contain genes that code for our respective genitals, the physical development of the ovaries, uterus, and vagina in females, or the testes, prostate, and penis in males. All of these structures require specific gene sequences, which code for various proteins and regulate their expression. These genes are located on the sex chromosomes, although it should be understood that other genes exist on the sex chromosomes that have nothing to do with the genitals or the reproductive systems. These kind of genes are called sex-linked, they're linked to the sex of the individual and in that their specific sex chromosomes influence the gene's expression. A gene in the Y chromosome, for example, will only be expressed in males, as females don't have a Y chromosome in the first place. We have 46 chromosomes, 23 coming from each of our parents. A chromosome in one parent corresponds to a chromosome in the other parent. These similar chromosomes contain genes that code for the same traits, but they have different alleles. A useful name for these chromosomes is homologs, or homologous chromosomes, where the prefix homo implies the similarity of the genes. All humans share the same 23 chromosomes, which means that you have 23 pairs of homologous chromosomes, each pair naturally being composed of the corresponding chromosomes from each parent. Because humans possess two copies of our genome, we are a diploid species. Many other species are diploid, also possessing two copies of their genome in their cells. Some species are haploid, possessing only one copy of the genome. Gametes, cells produced by diploids, are themselves haploid cells. Other species are triploid, meaning that they have three copies of their genome. The thing that creates differences between our mother and father, and differences between every individual human, is our specific combination of alleles. The allele is a version of a gene. An example I like to use is eye color. We all have an eye color, so we all have genes for the eye color trait. The allele is the version of that gene. So for the eye color gene, one allele codes for green eyes, while another allele codes for brown eyes, and a third allele codes for blue eyes, and so on and so forth. A large minority of the genes in the human genome have numerous alleles, just like the genes that code for eye color, or the genes that code for the level of pigment in your skin. These genes usually code for traits that are cosmetic, or open to variation. 
Consider your blood type. If you're type O, you have alleles that code for the plasma antibodies anti-A and anti-B, but none for blood cell antigens. If you're type AB, you have alleles that code for both the A and B antigens that coat your red blood cells, but you have no alleles that code for plasma-dwelling antibodies. If you have blood type A, you have alleles for the anti-B antibody in your plasma, and the A antigen coating your blood cells. Blood type B is the opposite, possessing alleles for the plasma antibody anti-A and blood cell coating B antigens. For the rest of our genes, for, for most of our genes, we all have the same alleles. These genes code for really important things like respiratory proteins or proteins involved in fetal development, you know, or stuff like that. If we didn't have these genes, or if there was a mutation to these genes that disabled the proteins, or the protein's expression, we would almost always die. Mutations to these highly conserved genes results in offspring who, for example, aren't able to breathe properly due to a mutation in a respiratory protein, or who develops improperly in the womb and becomes a stillborn. Highly conserved genes basically code for proteins that are extremely important to basic homeostasis or some fundamental life process. A highly conserved regulatory gene, for example, will be involved in the critically important timing of developmental expression. And if these regulatory genes are disabled so that they can no longer regulate the organism's development, say in the stage of an embryo, it will almost always develop malformed and be born stillborn. Other examples of such highly conserved genes include those that code for proteins involved in the electron transport chain, or neural tube development, or the mouth-nose complex. Because of the high risk of mortality associated with any kind of mutation in these areas, the functional versions of these genes are highly conserved through natural selection. Many of these highly conserved genes have just one or two alleles, or a small handful of alleles with extremely minor differences between them. All genes, whether they be highly conserved genes or mutable genes with many different alleles, are heritable. All genes are heritable. This is to say that all genes can be passed down from parent to offspring. The traits that the offspring receives are those that are coded for in the specific alleles carried by the fertilizing gametes. So when a sperm binds with and fertilizes an egg, they mix their haploid genetic material to create the complete diploid genome of a new person. This genetic material takes the form of chromosomes. Before I cover the process in depth, I want to briefly summarize the two stages of meiosis. The first stage is very similar to mitosis. The DNA condenses and this forms 46 chromatids. Each chromatid is a single string of DNA, compacted and coiled into the chromosome structure. The 46 chromatids associate with their homolog, creating 23 pairs of homologous chromatids. Each chromatid then replicates itself, and so each homologous pair is now composed of two groups of two DNA molecules for a total of four chromatids. This forms a complex called a bivalent. The 23 bivalents or 23 groups of four chromosome copies. So now we've got 46 times two, which is 92. We've got 92 chromosome copies all in the cell during this stage of meiosis. So all 23 bivalents, or all 92 chromosome copies, line up at the metaphase plate, just like they do in mitosis, where they then get split up and separated into the two corners of the dividing cell. Once the cell divides and produces two diploid daughter cells, this stage of meiosis is over. In mitosis, these daughter cells would then mature and go on to live functional lives. In meiosis, however, these daughter cells undergo another round of division called meiosis II. So understand that the process as I described it, the process of meiosis II, is happening to both of the daughter cells from meiosis I at the same time. Meiosis II is similar to meiosis I in that the DNA is once again lined up in the middle along the metaphase plate, where it's split up and dragged to opposite ends of the cell and the cell subsequently divides. The critical difference here is that in meiosis II, the DNA doesn't replicate beforehand. So in meiosis I, we have 23 pairs of homologous chromosomes, and these replicate, and that creates 23 bivalents, or 23 groups of four chromosome copies, and each of these are split apart. This resulted in two daughter cells, each with 23 chromosome pairs, or 46 chromosomes in total. In meiosis II, this DNA replication doesn't happen. There's no bivalence. Instead, the structures that get pulled apart are composed of just two chromatids. When they get split up, only one chromosome gets pulled to a corner of the cell instead of two. 
As a result, the daughter cells of meiosis II only have one copy of the chromosome, instead of the two copies possessed by the daughter cells of meiosis I and mitosis. In this way, mitosis takes one diploid cell and produces two diploid daughter cells, while meiosis takes one diploid cell and ultimately produces four haploid daughter cells. These haploid cells are called gametes, and they're the fundamental key to sexual reproduction. With that brief summary out of the way, let me start back at the beginning, at the start of meiosis I, so that we can explore the mechanisms and details of the whole process. Meiosis I is itself composed of five phases, which are called, in sequential order, prophase I, metaphase I, anaphase I, telophase I, and lastly, cytokinesis. All of these phases are called telophase I, or metaphase I, because they're all a part of meiosis I, or the first half of meiosis where the parent diploid cell is dividing into two daughter diploid cells. Prophase I, the first and longest stage, can also be broken up into substages, namely the leptotene, zygotene, pacotene, diploteen, and diakinesis stages. That sounds kind of complicated, but don't worry about it too much. It's not crazy important, and I won't go into too much detail about it. So anyway, in early prophase I, specifically in the leptotene stage, the cell is fresh out of interphase, fresh out of the G2 stage of the cell cycle. To mark its entrance into M phase, the DNA in the cell begins to get packaged and condensed into chromosomes, and the spindle apparatus and its associated complex of microtubules begins to form. The synaptonemal protein complex that holds homologous chromosomes together also begins to form. As the DNA was replicated during interphase, each emerging chromosome is composed of two sister chromatids. Each chromosome then has the stereotypical X shape, where the left and right lines of the X represent a chromatid. Remember the fact that sister chromatids are not homologs. Sister chromatids are copies of one another, like a strand of DNA from one person, and a naturally formed copy of that strand that all exists within that one person's cells. Homologs, on the other hand, are chromosomes that share the same genes, but not necessarily all the same alleles. Each homologue and homologous pair comes from one of your parents, specifically those corresponding 23 pairs of chromosomes that they give you. A fundamental and defining aspect of meiosis occurs early in prophase I, during the zygotene stage. Here, the homologous chromosomes associate with one another, and they naturally form those 23 pairs of homologous chromosomes. This natural association between homologues is called synapsis, and it doesn't occur in mitosis. The cell undergoes synapsis when its homologous chromosomes physically associate, lining up side by side with one another. You know, they line up and they match, you know, e equivalent parts. Because they're homologous chromosomes, they share similar gene sequences. And so when they're packaged into a chromosome, they kind of share similar, you know, meta patterns in the superstructure of the chromosome. And so when they pair up together, these patterns align and it helps the chromosomes stay together. Another important event happens immediately before this pairing. A deliberate break is induced at some random point in the DNA strand of a chromatid. This break in the DNA will be involved in a future crossing over event, but I'll get to it as it happens during the whole process. Anyways, this synapsis forms by valence, which are, as I said, two sister chromatids associated with their homologs, which are also sister chromatids. The bivalent is held together by the synaptonemal complex, a group of remarkably adhesive proteins that holds all four strands together. Because there are four strands of DNA involved in a bivalent, they can also be called tetrads, where tetra means four. So the formation of the bivalents, or the tetrads, brings us into the pacotene stage. This event is marked by the collapse of the nuclear envelope. Both phospholipid bilayers and the double membrane of the nuclear envelope begin to dissolve, falling apart in clumps before melting away into the cytosol. The microtubules formed earlier in prophase I begin to randomly attach to the kinetochores of the chromosomes, the central cluster of proteins at the center of the X shape, you know, the structure that holds the sister chromatids together. As the microtubules attach, the synaptonemal complex begins to collapse, and the bivalent loses its structural integrity. This causes the homologs to begin to pull apart, but they don't quite separate entirely. Not, not quite yet. When some parts of the homologs detach, they form gaps called chiasma, or chiasmata, while other parts of the homologs remain stuck together. These points where the DNA sticks together are the same points that experienced DNA strand breaks earlier, at the beginning of prophase I. 
Most homologs get at least one chiasma during prophase 1, although two or three chiasma on a single homolog pair isn't unheard of. It's at these points of residual stickiness, uh, of, of you know, residual leftover sticking together, that these exchanges called recombination begin to happen. The maternal and paternal homologs physically swap portions of their DNA with one another in a process called crossing over. Crossing over is an important event in generating genetic diversity. You receive maternal and paternal homologs, but when you create gametes that will eventually produce offspring, those gametes have chromosomes that are blended mixes of the homologous maternal and paternal chromosomes in your cells. This means that a hard copy of, uh, for example, your maternal chromosomes don't get passed on. Crossing over, or recombination, instead causes your homologs to shuffle themselves up a little bit. This shuffling of genetic material to create unique allele combinations is the reason why your kids look like you, but not exactly like you. It's the reason why you look like your parents, but not exactly like your parents. Instead of getting hard copies of their chromosomes, where the entire copy is just unchanged and expressed, instead of the genetic material gets mixed up a little bit, and this creates unique, novel variety. Anyways, these chiasma form and they enable crossing over to occur in the pacotene stage. This, in addition to the collapsing synaptonemal complex, allows the homologous chromosomes to begin to separate, and this defines the diplotene stage. In the diakinesis stage, the chromosomes have condensed enough to make themselves and their chiasmata visible. Additionally, the meiotic spindle begins to form as the nuclear envelope collapses. Pairs of centromeres push into opposite corners of the cell, with their microtubules reaching out for the chromosomal kinetochores. Once the microtubules from the spindle apparatus have attached to the kinetochores of the chromosomes and the tetrads, the cell enters metaphase 1. In this stage, the spindle apparatus organizes all the tetrads into a single plane, running along the center of the cell, also called the metaphase plate. In this way, the metaphase stage is very similar in both meiosis and mitosis. The cell now enters anaphase 1. The microtubules begin to fray, pulling chromosomes to the centromeres of the spindle apparatus situated at each end of the cell. The new homologs in each tetrad are pulled apart by the retracting microtubules, and the cell then enters telophase 1. Here, the retracting microtubules drag the separated homologs to each end of the cell. Keep in mind that the sister chromatids are still attached. The last stage occurs when everything is separated. Cytokinesis occurs as the cytoplasm is pinched off to form two new daughter cells with freshly mixed chromosomes. The second stage of meiosis is unimaginatively called meiosis II. Each daughter cell of meiosis I goes through meiosis II to produce two daughter cells of their own, so the total number of daughter cells produced through meiosis is four. Meiosis II has five stages, prophase II, metaphase II, anaphase II, telophase II, and again, cytokinesis. These stages are all similar to their analogous stages in meiosis I. So prophase II begins with the quick reformation of the spindle apparatus. If the nuclear membrane was partially or fully restored after meiosis I, it dissolves again during prophase II. Recall that the daughter cells of meiosis I each have two copies of the genome, but most or all of these chromosomes have new combinations of alleles from the maternal and paternal chromosomes crossing over. This means that meiosis II involves cell replication with half the number of chromatids of the previous replication. The 23 pairs of recombined sister chromatids attach to the newly formed spindle apparatus. And this takes us to metaphase II, where the spindle apparatus organizes the sister chromatids along the metaphase plate. During anaphase II, the centromeres of the spindle apparatus are pushing into opposite sides of the cell and pulling all the chromatids with it. This combined force causes the sister chromatids to physically pull apart. This also causes the cell to enter telophase II, a brief stage where the microtubules once again break apart at their tips, dragging the attached chromatids back towards their centromeres. Once each set of 23 chromosomes has been pulled to opposite sides of the cell, the membrane pinches off and forms two daughter cells. As meiosis II produced two daughter cells of its own, their combined replication in meiosis II produces a total of four daughter cells. But notice that these final four cells only got one set of the 23 chromosomes, and not two. This makes them haploid, and it's the defining characteristic of the gamete, or the egg and the sperm. In this way, the gamete-producing cells in your ovaries and testicles begin as a single diploid cell with replicated chromosomes, 
which then divides into two diploid daughter cells, who each then divide again into two haploid daughter cells. These haploid cells are gametes, and they're called eggs in females and sperm in males. As haploid cells, they only have one copy of their chromosomes, so when a sperm fertilizes an egg, the cells chemically merge together. Their precious DNA cargo combines inside of the egg, binding and initiating the chemical processes that translate and transcribe this now full set of DNA to produce a new human being. It's important to understand that this really is a new human being. Asexual organisms have plenty of offspring, but they're all genetically identical to the parent. Sexual reproduction, or the use of gametes to shuffle allele information, is able to generate a degree of genetic variety. This genetic variety is healthy for the gene pool, as it induces greater phenotypic variations in the population. In the wild, not so much in our sheltered and comfortable urban lifestyles, greater phenotypic variation meant that a species had greater evolutionary adaptability. If there's a wide variety between individuals, it's more likely that some will survive exposure to an adverse condition like a disease or a predator or a change in the environment. A great deal of this variety is generated through a process called independent assortment, where each chromosome is pulled into one daughter cell or the other, independent of where the other chromosomes are going. To put it another way, groups of associated genes on different chromosomes are not passed down as a consistent collection of alleles. Independent assortment shuffles these chromosomes randomly, so that the combination of alleles in an offspring is different than the specific combination of alleles in either parent. In this way, meiosis generates new allele combinations in a phenomenon called genetic recombination. If you want to try and get a glimpse of understanding how much variation this can produce, take a peek at the math behind it. So diploid species have two copies of their chromosomes, so they have two to the n possible combinations of maternal and paternal chromosome sets where n is equal to the number of chromosomes in a single set. As humans have two copies with 23 chromosomes in each copy, the number of possible combinations of maternal and paternal chromosomes is 2 to the 23rd, or 8,388,608. This is just the variety possible in a single offspring of two parents. When you start taking into consideration the possible genetic combinations of families, or entire lineages, the number of possible combinations becomes astronomical. The actual flesh and blood people depicted in dusty history books and extended family trees are the single combination out of that 8.4 million that happened to make it, to fertilize one another in the womb. For that matter, you, as you are right now, are the one single combination of genes and alleles out of the combinations your parents could have had. They could have had any kid out of 8.4 million possibilities. And for better or worse, they got you. Now that I've talked about the process of meiosis as it properly occurs, I want to talk about what happens when stuff goes wrong. As meiosis involves the DNA itself of an emergent life form, the proper unfolding of the process is critical to its health and vitality. Even the smallest mistake this early in the development of the organism will almost always cause a catastrophic and usually lethal malformation. At a minimum, 25% of human conceptions are spontaneously aborted when errors or problems in meiosis are detected. As you can tell, meiosis is a delicate process. It has several steps that have to be conducted pretty much flawlessly, especially steps involving separation of the chromatids. Failure for the chromatids to properly separate is called non-disjunction, and it can be a very serious problem. The homologs have to separate properly during anaphase 1, such that each daughter cell gets only one homolog from each of the 23 pairs. If they don't, then one daughter cell will have too many homologs, and the other will have too few, and this will complicate subsequent steps and produce gametes with an irregular number of chromosomes. Another important event is the separation of sister chromatids into each gamete in meiosis II. If the sister chromatids fail to separate, then both will get dragged into a single daughter cell. So gametes with irregular numbers of chromosomes will produce offspring with irregular number of chromosomes, and these offspring suffer from the associated genetic diseases and abnormalities. So let's say that some chromatids suffer non-disjunction, that is, they fail to break apart properly. The emergent gametes have an irregular number of chromosomes. One has too many, the other has too few. If the gamete with too few chromosomes can become fertilized with a healthy, normal gamete, the emergent zygote will be missing one copy of a chromosome. This condition of having a single copy of a chromosome is called monosomy. 
Conversely, the gamete with too many chromosomes can be fertilized with a healthy and normal gamete, and this produces a zygote with an extra copy of a chromosome in a condition called trisomy. The tri in trisomy designates that the zygote has three copies of that chromosome, instead of the normal two. When an organism has any of these irregular chromosome numbers, it's called an aneuploid. So consider chromosome 21. If a human zygote suffers from monosomy 21, that is, it's aneuploid with only a single copy of its 21st chromosome, then it virtually never survives until birth. Individuals who only have one copy of chromosome 21 suffer complications during their development, and they almost always become stillborn. On the other hand, if a human zygote is aneuploid with three copies of chromosome 21, it suffers from trisomy 21. Zygotes with trisomy 21 are much more likely to survive till birth than, uh, than those with monosomy 21, but they suffer from a condition called Down syndrome. This syndrome is marked by delayed growth and cognitive development, intellectual disability, and several distinguishing physical characteristics, including short height and finger length, slanted, wide-set eyes, and a large tongue and a small mouth that can induce obstructive sleep apnea. Now consider chromosome 13. Trisomy 13 is known as Patau syndrome, and it's a brutally disfiguring genetic disease. Those with trisomy 13 who are born alive suffer from microcephaly, or a shrunken head. They also suffer from a cleft palate, eye and spine defects, and brain disabilities, as well as abnormal numbers of fingers and toes. They often have deformed feet, hands and genitals, heart defects and kidney problems, and uh, many other symptoms. Unfortunately, this severely disfiguring disease is extremely difficult and expensive to treat. 80% of children with trisomy 13 die before their first birthday. Now consider chromosome 18. Trisomy 18 is known as Edwards syndrome, and it's a similarly disfiguring genetic disease. Symptoms of Edwards syndrome include heart, lung, brain, and intestinal malformations that lead to impaired growth and difficulty eating and breathing, as well as brain cysts that form in a layer called the choroid plexus. The head is usually small, with low-set ears and a small jaw under a cleft palate. The hands are underdeveloped, missing fingernails, and the feet are malformed, and this impairs movement. Now consider trisomy X, or three copies of the X chromosome, also called triple X syndrome. Unlike the other trisomy diseases I just discussed, trisomy X isn't brutally disfiguring or highly lethal, and many women who have it are still fertile and able to have healthy children. Trisomy X affects about 0.1% of women, and they possess three X chromosomes that can induce the formation of subtle but distinguishing characteristics like wide-set eyes and above-average height. Trisomy X also isn't nearly as psychologically and intellectually disabling as the other examples. Some women with Trisomy X experience slow language development and seizures, and this can lead to depression and social anxiety. In general, trisomy is a condition that affects smaller chromosomes, like chromosomes 13 to 22, much more often than it affects larger chromosomes, like chromosomes 1 to 12. With this in mind, it makes sense that trisomy 21 is the most common kind of survivable aneuploidy, as chromosome 21 is the smallest of the human autosomes. Furthermore, these problems are far more common in children born to mothers over the age of 35, due to the fact that the biomolecular machinery in the eggs begins to degrade in both structure and function over time. That about covers it, I believe, for, uh, for most of meiosis. Um, it's important to understand that meiosis came about in evolutionary history as a mechanism for generating genetic diversity. Genetic diversity confers variation in the phenotypes, and thus the fitness, of individuals within a population. This phenotypic variation makes the population better able to survive and adapt to strenuous conditions and selection pressures. Species that reproduce asexually do not have this built-in means of creating genetic diversity. An asexual individual will pass all of their genes on to all of their offspring, including deleterious or mutated genes. Asexual populations are at greater risk from diseases, as they often lack the genetic variety necessary to defend themselves. As a result, a single disease can wipe out entire populations of asexual organisms. Sexually reproducing species can be wiped out by diseases too, no doubt about it. But from the perspective of the disease-causing pathogen, it's a lot harder. In an asexual population, every individual has the same chemical defenses. If you overcome the defenses for one individual, you overcome the defenses for everyone. 
it's kind of like having a kingdom where every castle has the same general layout. And so if you figure out a way to get past the fortifications of one castle, you pretty much know how to get past the fortifications of every single castle in the kingdom. Much the same way, a disease that infects an asexual population only needs to be able to infect one individual, because if they can get through that one person's immune system, every other person in the asexual population, every other individual, they all have the same genes, the same alleles, they have the same immunology, so they basically have the same you know, fortifications, more or less, and the disease can just use the same mechanism, the same plan, to go through and invade individual after individual. And this is why asexual populations are at such risk. But if you're attacking a sexual population, every individual has a slight variation in their immunology that gives them variable defenses to disease. So to continue the metaphor, it's like every castle in the kingdom has a slightly different defense. And so is the attacking pathogen. You have to work your way through each slightly different defense to get into each castle. It's a little harder, and it'll take you a lot longer. And so when you're looking at the evolution of life and the variables that'll increase your likelihood of survival, this increased genetic variety is extremely valuable. All right, everyone, I think that's about it. I know this was kind of a, a quick, brief episode on meiosis. Uh, I hope you learned something cool. I hope you enjoyed it. Next episode, I'll be discussing transcription and translation. So if that sounds cool, be sure to check it out. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, hit the like button and subscribe. Share the episode with a teacher, a friend, or a classmate. If you want to support the show, follow us on social media and consider buying something from the official store. Follow us on Twitter. Our username is at Biologic Podcast. To buy something from the store, go to redbubble.com and search for Biologic. Or go directly to the store at redbubble.com slash people slash biologic slash shop. Become an official patron of the show. Sign up at patreon.com slash biologic podcast. Your support really helps the show. So if you like it, send us some love. And as always, thanks for listening.